Well, uh, I'm not gonna bore you with more gloomy stuff. Uh, but we're talking about brand risk, so I have to talk about risk uh, in general. I have a slightly different take on brand risk. So, uh, in my perspective, brand is not only scientific, it's also about arts. Right? How you manage brand, it's something more artistic than scientific. And I also believe that branding is also more emotional than rational. Of course, if you're a Samir with brand finance, you want to um, calculate brand valuation of your brand, uh, there's a scientific method to it, but when you build brands, uh, it's more on the emotional side of things. And I would like to start with an, a very simple idea. Uh, to me, brand risk, the biggest risk that brand will face in the future is to remain relevant or to stay relevant. Because the world is changing at a rapid pace, and if brands cannot adapt to that pace, brands will be in trouble. So I'm gonna talk about three major trends that I think will affect brands' sustainability. So let me start with something that we already know. Generation gap. Probably many of you didn't know that this is the first time in history that we all have five generations living together on Earth which means that brand might serve five different generations at the same time. And if you're a global brand, if you're a mass brand serving a large consumer base, you gotta serve all five of them. And you, you need to stay relevant for everyone. Right? That is the biggest challenge, because you have the baby boomers who are aging, but you have the generation X, which holds the power uh, in the corporate world today, you have the millennials that are quite challenging to manage in the workforce and also in the consumer market. And you also have these children, these uh, young people, Generation Z, and of course, Alpha. They ran out of alphabet, they, so they started the Gen A. They didn't know that we will end up with A because they thought we will end at Z. And, uh, so they started over. So. These are five generations. Right? Some of you are baby boomers, some of you. Your economic powerhouse, you have huge spending powers, but you're aging. So to hold on to that generation as your key consumer base will be problematic. Because in the future, these people will retire and will have less spending power. So you have to bank on your uh, endeavors on a younger generation, so it comes down to Generation X. You know, most of you probably are not aware that 51% of leadership roles globally is being held by a Generation X guys. So 51%. These guys are growing up, they were growing up watching MTV, and they're now leading the boardroom, CSU. They're very, very powerful uh, in today's era. They're replacing the aging baby boomers. But then again, you have one more problematic situation where you have the Gen, the gen Y or millennials. You know what they call Gen Y? Because they always ask why. <laughs> why, why, why? And the baby boomers are getting tired to answer their whys. You know, in the workforce, these kids keep on asking you why, and you say to them, just work, right? Why question everything? Because they grow up during the internet boom, so they question everything because they think they know everything and they know they can search everything on Google. But then, we talk about millennials for probably 10 years, and they're, not, they're no longer young, you know? We've been talking about millennials since 10 years ago and they're not no longer young. Now we have Generation Z, which is, not many people are aware as well, that they are actually the first digital native. They were born at the same time when the internet was born. So they, did, so they didn't grow up with the internet, they were born along with the internet. 
which means that as internet grows in terms of penetration, in terms of complexity, they grew as well. So they're more complex than the generation millennials or the Gen Y. But then we have the children of millennials. Like I mentioned, millennials are no longer young, they're old. The oldest one is probably 35 or 36. And they have a six, seven year old. And this six to seven year old can actually use an iPad before they learn how to read. It's so interactive that you just know what button to press. You don't have to read the text. So they live in a very graphical world, a very visual world that brands, you know, we talk a lot about brand names, right? Well, if you're using an iPad and you're being browsed by a seven-year-old, they won't care about what it reads. They will care about what the color is, what the shape is, is it funny, is it interactive, is it engaging? So trying to satisfy all five will be a very difficult task for any marketers to do. They all have different preferences. Older brands, established brands, they're, they attract mostly the older ones, baby boomers, Gen X, Gen Y. Established brands and experiential brands for that matter, engaging brands for that matter, they can only target at most two and a half generation. None of these, either one of established brand, experiential brand, engaging brand can target all five. If you want to target all five, you have to be all three. You have to be established, you have to be experiential, and you have to be engaging, which is very difficult. You know, the established brands, baby boomers love them. They hate um, rebellious movement. They like status quo. So they like brands that are old, trustworthy, proven over time. The Gen X is somewhat in the middle between millennials and baby boomers. They also love established brands, but they try to find other brands that can satisfy them. The, the Gen Y is totally rebellious. They don't really love established brands. They like experiential brands. They like to experiment with new brands, and they like to experiment with new products. But then, of course, there are the Gen Y, Z, and Alpha, which tends to love engaging brands. You know, I, I went to a mall in Jakarta um, a few months back, and I saw this groups of kids, Generation Z and Alpha, a group of kids, they line up, and there are hundreds of them in a mall, in the atrium, and they, they just sit there. And I asked, what are they doing? They're gamers. They're gamers. It's a big business. You know, there are six unicorns in Southeast Asia at this moment, there are only one profitable unicorn out of that six. The rest are not yet profitable. Out of that one, their biggest money comes from gaming. So, gaming is a big business because it's engaging. And you know what that kids do? They line up there, they watch people play games on the big screen, but what they do that they sit there, they watch it on their phone, which is ridiculous because they pay $200 to sit there. They're not watching on the screen, they're watching on their phone. Because it's more engaging to watch and to look at your phone instead of on the big screen. So this is the first risk that I think will affect brand the most. Let's move on to the second one. We've talked about technology and internet a bit when we talk about generation gap. Right? We live in a multi-dimensional world. You cannot serve a single generation and be profitable or be safe with your brands. You have to target at least two and a half or even five. But there's an even bigger problem that I'm gonna to touch even deeper. Half of the world's population is already online, but the other half is still offline, which creates a perfect 50-50 split, which creates dilemma. You know, people talk about e-commerce. It's a big thing. It's growing rapidly, doubling, tripling every single year. But you know the size of e-commerce globally is only 10% of total retail sales. We've been talking about it for five years and there's still only 10% of the total retail sales, which, which means that brick and mortar 
globally is still 90% of total sales. Which brings the question, is e-commerce or internet retailing a major threat? What is the stumbling block of these startups? The question is, the answer is digital divide because not everyone, even though they know how to use the internet, they know how to use a mobile phone or smartphone, they're just not comfortable with it. And this is the biggest divide. There are people on, on the left. They search online but because they don't trust the brand they go to the store and buy it in store. They just don't trust the online seller. It's called web rooming. A lot of older generation actually do the one on the left. But there are more exper uh, experimental people on the right. They experience in store, they go to the Nike store, they try sizing. When they know the sizes, they like the, which color they prefer, they found uh, the shoes that they want, they just buy it online for half the price. That's called showrooming. So there are two different groups of people, a group of consumers, one doing rep rooming and one doing showrooming, which create a problem in any case. If you are a brick mortar retailer, you can only target one. But if you're only an e-commerce player, you can only target one of them. What if you want to target both of them? Which is very difficult. Again, similar to the five generations, you got to have two different portfolio strategy on reaching out to these group of people. I'm going to talk about a financial services sector for a bit. Of course, Singapore is big on financial services. Uh, in recent years, we've been hearing about, we've been talking about uh, fintech, fintech startups. You know, banks are the major rulers of the financial services. They're big, they're huge. But even a corporation, even a, a, a major bank, can only reach as a, a small proportion of the market, which they call bankable. The bigger portion of the market is what they call unbankable. And these small startups, this kid, is trying to say to the banks, you know, we can reach these people because we have a lower cost, so we can reach these people and we can manage the risk because we can detect fraud, we can detect you know, um, uh, different forgeries and stuff, so we can help you reach out to these people. But the banks say, well, I have my own business model, I don't do fintech, uh, why don't I just do it myself, right? So these fintech guys ended up talking to the telco players globally. So the telco guys said, well, we're a match because I have a big consumer base, I'm bankable, but using a smartphone. So let's talk. So let's kill the banks together. So they get the backing of the big telco to fight the major banks. But this is a portrait of the digital divide because the banks, well, most of them, still trap in that trap of their own in terms of generation. They're serving people with large assets. People that has the highest profitability to serve but, on the other hand, they're aging. The future consumers are not those people with large assets, but they're influential, and they will become people with large assets in 10 to 20 years. So when you start thinking about the portfolio on how you target these different groups of people. So I'm gonna talk about the last one. The market is polarizing. This is probably due to Trump effect, you know, since ever since Trump took over the office, uh, it seems that the market is polarized even more. Um, well, the basis of polarizing market is simple. It's inequality. There are richer people, high net worth individuals, and there are poor people. And the gap is just widening globally all over the world. 
And because of that, you know, the rich people, they go to luxury outlets, they buy handbags for crazy prices, but the poor people, they struggle, they just feed themselves. So this inequality creates different viewpoints of the world, of course. And it's threatened, or should I say reinforced, by the social media filter bubbles. I don't know if anyone, uh, everyone here are familiar with filter bubbles. By the way, for those of you who are not aware of this term, filter bubbles is a very dangerous thing. It's considered the dark side of the internet. If you, you hate Trump, or you like McDonald's, and you've been talking about Trump in a negative way on Facebook, and you've been talking about McDonald's in a positive light on Facebook, Facebook will feed you only bad news about Trump and good news about McDonald's, which strengthen your original belief, which makes you more extreme. And you will never, never, ever compromise in the middle because the social media feeds you only the information that strengthen or reinforce your belief. That's called filter bubbles. You know, filter bubbles is good for remarketing. If you're browsing for shoes, you will get advertisement every day about shoes until you end up saying that I will need to buy a shoe. That's remarketing. That's the good side of internet. For digital marketers out there, that's a good thing because you can convince them you need to buy shoes. That's good. But on the other hand, the biggest challenge is if you believe that Starbucks is a bad place to drink coffee, you will believe that even more with Facebook. In your timeline, you will only read bad news about Starbucks. And that's what I call polarizing market. And it creates this polarizing consumer base. We talk about ethical brands, we talk about organic food, but there is the other side of that spectrum. There are people who are saying organic food is a fraud. It has no difference. It has no significant health benefits to just general food or GMO foods. There are people who are saying experiential luxury retailing with crazy prices is the best way to go. But some people are saying you're not smart because smart people go to Walmart, smart people go to Target, smart people go to discount stores or dollar stores. So it creates different polarity in the market. Uh, there are people who flew in with low cost airline, there are people flying with Emirates or Singapore Airlines, it creates a polarity in the market. This is what I call polarizing market. So, very beginning I talk about generation gap, digital divide, and polarizing market. This creates the risk, it poses the biggest risk for the brands. But of course, if you're a good marketer, if you're a good marketer, you see threats as opportunity, right? You don't see threat as something that scares you off. That's what I call, that's why I'm saying I'm not gonna tell any gloomy stories today, because when I see this, I see opportunity. Why is it an opportunity? Because when other people see Generation Gap as something troubling, I see it as something opportunistic for me. I can take advantage of that. If I can be the only brand in the market that can serve all five generations, I'll be the market leader. If I can be the one bridging that digital divide, then I'm gonna be the leader. If I can be the one to serve different spectrums, the different ends of the spectrums in the market, then I'll be the market leader. And we've been seeing that all over, all the major brands in the world. They started as a luxury product, but they go really, really low at the end of the spectrum because they wanna serve every inch of that spectrum. And how to do that, it's not that easy. I'm gonna, I know I don't have much time left. I'm gonna be very quick about it. But before we, uh, we move on to the solution, I'm gonna talk about uh, food service case a bit. You know, if we do a survey, and this is a survey by YouGov, uh, Starbucks, 30% uh, 30 lover, 
23% haters. Are you aware of the uh, concept called Net Promoter Score? Some of you might recognize that. Net Promoter Score said you subtract the number of promoters with the number of detractors and you get the Net Promoter Score. What's the Net Promoter Score for Starbucks? 30 minus 23, which is 7%. Net Promoter Score concept tells you that if you have an NPS of 7%, you'll go bankrupt your brand will close down because it's a bad news to have a single digit NPS. And McDonald's is even worse. The NPS is, is 4%. But they're not closing down, aren't they? They are not closing down. And the truth is they're growing rapidly, globally. Starbucks is growing, McDonald's is growing, they're really, really successful. And this is the tricky thing about the digital world because, you know, in the past, traditional marketers believed that negative advocacy or negative word of mouth is a bad thing. But in digital space, it's actually a good thing because it drives conversation. You know, when people say bad things about your brand, you'll be sure that there will be a promoter defending it. You are waking up a promoter by having a hater. You're provoking the entire market by having this 50-50 split, one saying good things about you and the other half are saying bad things about you. And when you have these two halves together, it will create conversation about you. And no brands in the world can satisfy everyone. So if you're polarizing, means you're doing something good. You're being closer to who you really are, instead of trying to satisfy everyone. So what's the way to handle these things, right? Number one, there are three probably tips I, sh I should say that I can share with you on how you mitigate the risk or take advantage of it as an opportunity. Number one is integrated content. Integrated content means that you will only need one brand positioning. Don't get me wrong, if, you have, if you're serving five generations, you don't need five brand positioning. <laughs> People will get confused about who you are if you have five, because you're saying positioning number one is for baby boomers, positioning number two is for Gen X, you're in trouble, right? You'll be nobody to anyone if you're doing that. So what do you do? You have one brand positioning, but you communicate it differently through different contexts, but it's integrated because it talks about the same thing, only in a different way. You know what, what generation Z, generation alpha likes the most? Entertainment. They're gamers. They don't like for you to educate them and tell you tell them product specifications, telling them product knowledge or the benefit of your product versus competitors. They're not going to do that. They want to see someone falling and laugh about it, right? They want to see that. And you see, the, all the biggest YouTubers, people who create videos, they're all crazy people because when you see their channel. It doesn't make sense why people like them. Because it's so weird and so unusual. But that's entertainment, right? That's entertainment. It's not educating, but it's entertaining. For generation baby boomers, you can't do the same way. Probably they want education. And some of them probably need convincing. Or maybe inspiring. And you go different routes try to convey the same message through different ways of doing it and through different channels. You can start by using, can we move on to the next slide please? You can use different channels. For example, if you want to entertain people, the top trending things right now is to use YouTube videos. Create a viral video. 
Or if we're trying to convince people, that's too far. Can I go back? Yeah. If you're trying to convince people, you might need to do product demo or case studies. If you're trying to inspire people, maybe you should consider listing your product on a top review sites, a top list. So different ways to talk about the same thing. And you can always, always have a single brand positioning for tailoring the message with the right tonality and using the different media to spread the news. So this is one. Second is you gotta have what we call omni-channel customer experience. CX, by the way, is customer experience. Uh, it's a catchy name for it. So omni-channel CX talks about integrating online and offline channel. And it's not multi-channel, right? A lot of people mistake complete think that omnichannel is having online and offline channel at the same time, which is truly not. Because the biggest difference is how do you actually, how do you actually integrate online and offline channel in a single customer journey? That is omnichannel. Multi-channel means that you only serve online people with online channel and offline people with brick and mortar stores, which is two different routes. But omnichannel is about integrating both in a single customer journey, serving the same people. Which means probably this one guy saw the TV ad, they know about a brand, they watch it again on a mobile phone, because TV can only spend 30 seconds, and it's already very expensive for 30 second ad. It will probably just drive awareness. But when you see it on mobile phone, it drives interest because you can go longer and you can interact with them in a nicer way. So the appeal probably comes from watching mobile ad. But then they got curious and they say, I want to ask for the question. So I'm going to just chat them and they get replies from chat bots. They're quite happy with the original information, but they're not really satisfied. So they say, I'm going to go talk to the sales rep who knows better than the chat bot. The problem is if your sales rep is actually doesn't know better than chat bot. <laughs> That's the biggest issue. You talk to your sales rep and say, you come to the right brand, be convinced we're the right brand for you, buy us right here, right now. They buy it in the store, they tell their friends about it, they brag about the new products they just bought, and when you brag, in the digital world, it's not about just talking to people. You post it on Instagram as well. So you post it on Instagram and it become a free advertising for the brand. You see, the jump be between offline and online world seamlessly because people nowadays live in both worlds without any recognition on which stage they are in. You know, I don't know if it's happening in Singapore, but it's happening definitely in Jakarta. And it's definitely happening in other places in the world where the young generation, they sit in a cafe or a coffee shop. They just sit there, five of them. They're friends, they're good friends. The night before, they talk to one another on the, on the chat or the group, WhatsApp group, and they say, let's meet tomorrow at this coffee shop. Let's meet tomorrow, all five of us. So they meet there the next morning. See? They don't talk to each other. They just sit there, they play with their phone. Every single one of them play with their phone, but they meet in a, the same coffee shop, which means they're actually hybrids. They're actually living in two worlds. They're sitting on the same physical outlet, a coffee shop, but they're living in digital space. You know what they do? They play with their phone, they're gaming, and they're playing in the same game room. They could have just done that in their own houses, right? They just sit in their room and they meet on the chat or gaming room. They don't, they don't have to meet, but they do have to meet. 
That's the point exactly, because they're living in an offline and online world at the same time. The final message is that you have to be a human-centric brand. Any Batman fans here? Oh, you're a Batman fan. Okay, good. Me too. Okay. Uh, you know, I've been struggling to understand a bit about how Batman has transformed over the years. Uh, in the past, you know, when you look at classic Batman, it's just pow, boom, and all that, and he always wins. He always just wins. And you watch Dark Trilogy, he always loses. Like, he only wins in the last five minutes. He loses all the time. And, you know, Batman in Dark Trilogy always cries. He cries all the time. It's like a baby. You know, he cries all the time. And you know why the <laughs> Batman is, uh, is crying all the time? Because he wants to look human. He wants to look human. He's not superhuman. He's just human. He wants to portray that humanness of Batman. And you know the latest Batman movie, which people say is the best Batman movies ever, is the Lego Batman movie. Where the, where the Batman there is portrayed to be an insecure and needy person whose best friend is actually the Joker. Because he's so insecure, he needs an enemy to accompany him every day. So this type of superhero is something we will never hear. We wouldn't even notice that there's this kind of superheroes 20 years back. Because superheroes 20 years back is a superhero. They're superhuman, cannot be beaten. They're perfect human being. But brand nowadays, you know, no brands is perfect. And trying to be perfect kills you. What brands should do today is just open up. Here's my weakness. Here's my strength. If you like my strength, talk about it. If you hate my weakness, talk about it. Be my hater. If you like me, tell good things about me. If you hate me, tell bad things about me. That's fine. There's no way controlling them. In social media, it's useless. It's pointless to try to tell them, no, don't tell bad things about us. Tell good things. No use. Let them tell bad things about you. It personifies your brand to be an authentic brand in the mind of consumers. Because in the mind of the consumers, you know why don't they why they don't trust corporations or brands? Because they think corporation and brands have hidden agenda. How come a brand is always perfect? They must they must have hide something behind their perfect st uh, stature. That's what they think. That's the perception in the market. So for a brand to be perfect, it just kills you because people will, will trust you even less if you're perfect. So what, did, what, do you should, what should you do in the circumstances? You have to be human, and to be human, there are six major elements to be humans. Physicality, Physicality, intellectuality, sociability, emotionality, personability, and morality. I'm not going to talk in greater details about this, but I'm going to give you an example. A human centric brand is a brand that knows their limitation. You like beautiful people, of course, that's physicality. You like beautiful people. But most of the time, the perception is, if you're beautiful, then you're not as smart. That is the kind of perception. If you're meeting someone that is so beautiful and smart, oh, this guy or this lady must have problems. Because no one is perfect, right? Probably not sociable enough. Probably beautiful, smart, but not sociable. Or probably the guy's a gangster. Handsome, nice, smart, but part of a big gangster team somewhere. That's what they believe. And so you should just feed them that, right? 
if they believe that, that is what you should be portraying your brands to be. Just be honest about what your brand is and what your brand isn't. I'm gonna stop here. I'm gonna review what I've been talking about for the past 20, 25 minutes. Um, we've been talking about three different risks, generation gap, digital divide, and a polarizing market. And if you wanna take advantage of these three, in any industry, if you talk about risks, and you wanna mitigate risks, what do you do? You create a portfolio of strategy. Don't put your eggs on the same basket. You wanna have a portfolio of strategy. You wanna have a portfolio of products. Banking on different segments, banking on different generations. You wanna have a portfolio or scenario of marketing strategy. If it goes this way, you're prepared. If it goes that way, you are already prepared as well. What do you do if you wanna mitigate risk? You bank on your most profitable and most important assets, your most important customers, but try to experiment and grow further into uncharted territories and try to find other ways or other people to serve in case that one asset that you have collapses. And that is the only basic knowledge on how to mitigate risk. Across all industries, across all concepts, that's how you mitigate risk. Hope you get the insightful information. It's been a pleasure, you've been a good audience. Thank you so much.